Well, the time has arrived. The time for the final 10 vehicles in my top 100 favourites. And there are definitely a couple of vehicles, maybe cars and bikes, that will not make sense to many of you. Some of them you might not even like, in the slightest, in fact. But for me, of course, it is the most personal section of the entire list, because these are my absolute favourites. There are vehicles here that I hope to own at some point, there are vehicles that I already own, and there are vehicles which unfortunately, regardless of money, I will probably never get the chance to own because I doubt they would even be available for sale. And what better way to kick it off than with number 10, a car which, if I recall correctly, has actually dropped a couple of places since the top 50, but of course it still has to be in my top 10, my single favourite car from my favourite overall car manufacturer, the Maserati MC12. To me, this is the ultimate modern example of proof that a car can be a drivable piece of art that can also win races. Proof that you do not have to be a Chaparral 2J that does nothing for the visuals and everything for the performance, or a McLaren F1 which would never win a beauty contest, but won plenty of races. To me, the Maserati does both. It is a Zonda F and a McLaren F1, or and a Selene S7, put together. It wins races, and it looks absolutely incredible. And I would argue it has probably the single most iconic livery of any non-race car ever built. Next up though, we move into the car out of my top 10, which I'm very proud to say I own. It was my first car, I still own it, and I love it more the longer I have it. It had some issues initially, but those are sorted out, and even though something else could always break on any car, I still love it for how good it is. And that is, of course, the Volkswagen Touareg, V10 TDI, a car which from my literal real life experience proves that car manufacturers need to take racing games more seriously. Because the single biggest reason why I wanted to buy this car was because of a racing game. That is something which older people simply do not say these days, but for younger people racing games do influence their choices, and this is a perfect example for me because I love this car in Test Drive Unlimited, and I decided I wanted one, so I bought it, and I love it. Just under 5 litres, twin turbo, 550 pound-feet of torque, over 300 horsepower, and even though some journalists would say it feels a little bit long in the tooth these days and isn't the most economical thing around, I would actually beg to differ. It's still a car which can keep up with the Subaru WRX, I know because I have done that. Mine is remapped, so it's even more powerful and has more torque. The fuel economy, I regularly get about 36 miles per gallon on the highway, so forget any of those arguments about it not being good. I find that incredibly impressive for what it is, and it can pull anything. It doesn't even notice hills. It's an incredible performance car. On paper, it's not the quickest thing around anymore, but boy, you don't feel that when you're driving it, that's for sure. The handling is fantastic. I love the interior design. It's practical, understated. It's the ultimate sleeper SUV, and it's something which everyone who knows what it is appreciates seeing it. But despite the fact that it is a proper, usable, practical, full-size SUV, it's probably the least offensive SUV on the market, because nobody ever complains about Tuaregs. They complain about stuff like Escalades and Hummers and Range Rovers. Nobody complains about Tuaregs, they're just there. It's just a utilitarian tool that does its job very well. And I happen to think it's a great-looking car as well. The next one on my list is technically an evolution of the same idea. This is a vehicle which I really, really hope to own in the not too distant future, but that depends on taxes, because the emissions that this car puts out are even worse than the Touareg, and that is what I consider to be its bigger brother, the Audi Q7 V12 TDI. I love this car, I have for a number of years now, and I love it more all the time. Every time I think about it, I appreciate it more for just how insane it is. I can't believe that they actually produced the Audi Q7 as a production car. Because quite literally, it is a seven-seater large SUV with an automatic gearbox, flappy paddles, all-wheel drive, fuel economy of about 25 miles per gallon. But at the same time, it's literally powered by a Lamar-winning diesel engine. To me, that is incredible. It has 
everything that the Tuareg can do, but turned up to 11. Instead of just an automatic, it's an auto with paddles. Instead of five seats, it has seven. Instead of being understated, it's over the top. Instead of a five litre V10, it's a six litre V12 with twin turbos, just like the Tuareg has. Instead of 310 horsepower, it's got 500. Instead of 550 pound feet of torque, it's got 740. This car has more torque than the Zonda R has power. That is insane, but it can still do 25 miles to the gallon, carry seven people around, has tons of trunk space, and I love the way it looks as well. I know the Q7 is not for everyone, but to me, this takes everything that I already love about the Tuareg, and it just turns it all up to 11, and I adore the Q7 for that. I hope that I get the chance to own one, but of course the used prices are way higher than a Tuareg these days, so we'll have to wait and see. Next up though, we move back into territory that the majority of you will probably understand a little bit more than an SUV, which would probably seem strange for anyone's top 10. This one is a proper supercar again though, one of my favourites, it's one of my dream supercars actually, the kind of car that if I had the cash, I would absolutely buy one, and it is of course the Mercedes SLR McLaren my single favourite Mercedes of all time. It's not even close for me, to be honest. I like the CLK GTR, I love the CL65, and of course I love the electric drive, all of which featured in the same series, but the SLR really is the one for me. You can keep your Sterling Moss, you can even keep your 722. To me, the standard SLR, albeit in the Roadster form, the open top, to me, that is perfection. The turbine wheels, silver, black, or maybe dark blue with the tan interior, to me, it is one of the most elegant, classiest, but also most muscular supercars ever built. And unfortunately, it doesn't tend to get the same kind of respect these days that its sibling, the Carrera GT, does. To me, that's a shame, because it's at least as good, just in different ways. Next up though, staying in the world of exotics, this one is even higher up the food chain, and it's the only, you could argue, full-on hypercar to be in my top 10. And that is, of course... My favourite hypercar, the SSC Ultimate Aero. Of course, the Tuatara was in my top 100 as well, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what that car can do, but there's just something about this car in its raw, old-school, almost sledgehammer approach to performance where it doesn't have the scalpel precision of a Bugatti or the finesse of a McLaren. It's the blunt object, in effect, just like the TVR Speed 12 was in the 90s, but unlike the Speed 12, this car had the chance to shine, and it didn't let them down. It was the fastest car in the world. And for all of those people who love to say, well, it just looks like a twin-turbo Diablo that was badly upgraded, trust me, I used to say those same things, but it really grew on me over time. And the fact that people also say, well, it only beat the Veyron by two or three miles an hour, that is so insulting to the Ultimate Aero, because it's not just the speed. It's the acceleration. This is, to this day, still one of the fastest accelerating cars ever produced. A Veyron Supersport does 0 to 200 miles an hour in about 20 seconds. A Chiron, a Chiron with 1500 horsepower, does 0 to 200 in 18 seconds. Do you know what an SSC Ultimate Aero did in over a decade ago? Under 15. That is insane. It's not even close to the Bugatti, it's not even close to Koenigsegg, and even though of course a Venom GT or a Koenigsegg Regera could probably beat it now, again, this car is over a decade old, it has no traction control, no all-wheel drive, barely any downforce, and a manual gearbox, which I won't hold against it, but the performance is insane. It's just raw brute power. It's America at its most cliched, and I absolutely love it for it. Plus, the icing on the cake is the fact that there was actually one of these for sale for $225,000. So it is by far the most attainable hypercar I've ever heard of. Next up though, speaking of attainable, this is actually one of the most attainable vehicles on the list, and actually, spoiler alert, my second favourite motorcycle of all time now, the very different Lightning LS218. For those who don't know, this is the fastest production bike in the world right now. I know that many people think that it's the Kawasaki H2. That's technically false, because there are two different versions. The faster version of the Kawasaki is not road legal, so it doesn't even count, and the road legal version can do like 209 miles an hour, so it's not even close. This, as the name suggests, is a Salt Flats Guinness Verified 218 
miles an hour from battery power with a single forward direct drive gearbox. I love this bike. It weighs around 200 kilos. It's very compact as far as super bikes go. It's not some big bloated battery filled monster. And even though I wish the styling was a bit more spicy, something more akin to a Bimota or an MV Augusta, still, it's more about what it can do. And it's certainly not a bad looking bike, that's for sure. You can buy it with three different battery sizes and the prices start at $38,000. So as far as performance goes, it's literally something that's as fast as a Ferrari Enzo for top speed, is faster than pretty much any other bike on the street for acceleration, for £38,000. I mean, that's insane. It is, spoiler alert, my favourite electric vehicle in the world. Next up though, a vehicle which many of you will not like. <laughs> in terms of the styling, it is extremely Marmite. You either love it or you absolutely hate it. And that is my favourite Spyker the Spyker D8, my favourite SUV, the only SUV that I want to own even more than the Audi Q7, and unfortunately for me, the single SUV that I will probably never be able to own, because they don't sell them, there were only two, as far as I know, ever built, there was the initial dark grey concept called the D12, which had a Volkswagen Source W12 engine, and then this one, which is my favourite, the D8, the white one from later on, which utilises a Cadillac CTS-V, 640 horsepower v8 engine so basically it combines two of my favorite brands spiker design with cadillac power to me that is perfection it's a 200 mile an hour suv technically it's a borderline crossover more than an suv really suicide doors of course a stunning interior and some people will view the interior as over the top i can appreciate that but for me as i said before pagani koenigsegg and spiker make the best interiors around and this is a perfect example of that. My only wish is that you could actually buy one, because it would be the ultimate SSUV. Forget the Lamborghini Urus, forget the Aston Martin DBX. This would be the quickest SUV around, and probably one of the quickest through corners as well, considering the styling. But, unfortunately, I'll probably never get a chance to know either way, and I highly doubt that Spyker would ever build it, considering that they're not exactly pumping out a huge amount of cars these days. But, staying on the topic of concept cars, this is a car which was already in my top 50, it was already very high, many of you already know that I love this car very much, but I will go so far as to say, to promise, in fact, that if I were ever in a financial position to buy this vehicle, and if the manufacturer in question were even willing to sell me said vehicle, which I doubt would ever happen anyway, I promise you this would become my favourite car of all time. I feel that strongly about this car, and it is, of course, the modern-day Bugatti Royale. The most ostentatious, over-the-top concept car of all time, as far as I'm concerned. The 13.6-litre, 830-cubic-inch, 1,000 horsepower, at least 1,000 foot-pounds of torque, V16-engined Cadillac 16. This is a car which I've loved ever since I first saw it. I adore seeing it in any racing game, from Test Drive Unlimited to Project Gotham to very rarely anywhere else, but, you know, you take what you can get. And it is a supercar level limo. And it's so much more than just a concept car. It's a car that has fantastic technology and great attention to detail already packed into it. It's a working car which you can actually drive. It has that full actual v16 engine not just a, a fake cardboard box sprayed silver it literally has that excellent fuel saver technology where you can make it a 12 or even an 8 cylinder instead of running all 16 and reportedly the car can return about 16 miles per gallon which is amazingly good for a v16 engine car i have no doubt that the performance is great for what it is the quoted or at least rumored weight is a lot lower than you'd think about 2.3 tons which I'll be honest, I find that very hard to believe. I don't think there's any way this car weighs 2.3 tons. My Touareg weighs 2.6. So how on earth could this car weigh 2.3? It doesn't look like carbon fibre to me. But regardless, as I said, if I could ever afford to buy it, and if Cadillac would ever be willing to sell it, which of course they never would, this would become my favourite car. And it would become the one car, the only car I would ever need. If I had a Cadillac 16, I would never want to buy another car again. And I will go happily on record saying that, because 
I literally love this car that much. It's an insane vehicle. I wish Cadillac had produced it, but a sadistic side of me is happy that they didn't because it means that if I ever did get the chance to buy it, it would be the only one in the world. And to me, that's just badass as well. But for now, you can't buy the Cadillac, not like I could anyway. So of course, the car that remains as my number one as far as cars go, but my number two on the list overall, the Ferrari FF, my dream car, a car which ticks many of the same boxes as something like a Cadillac 16, funnily enough, practicality, oversized design, but still not ridiculous to look at, excellent performance. Yeah, it's, it's my dream car. Look up the Novatec Rosso exhaust. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's one of the best sounding cars I've ever heard here on YouTube. It's got a gorgeous engine, 650 horsepower, flappy paddles, all-wheel drive, four seats, proper trunk space, 205 miles an hour. I mean, we're literally talking about a car that has the same cylinder type as an Enzo. It has the capacity of a Murcielago. It has the power of a Gumper Apollo, the top speed of a Carrera GT, the acceleration of a Zonda Cinque, the handling of a Nissan GTR or a Bentley Continental GT, and the practicality meets supercar appeal of a Lister Storm. And all of that for about £100,000 used. To me, that's my dream car. And because of the fact that I can never buy the Cadillac, it's probably going to remain my dream car for the foreseeable future. And yes, I already know the questions and comments that will be dropping down below, or why don't you like the GTC4 Lusso more than the FF? Simply put, I don't like the look of that car as much, I don't like the angular design, I prefer the curviness of this one, I don't like the fact that that one has more power and more performance, as weird as it sounds, because just like the Zonda F, I don't need any more performance from this car, I think it's already perfect, I love it as it is, yeah, it's my dream car, it's as simple as that. And of course, what else could be in number one but the same vehicle that was in number one from my top 50? Of course it's still my number one, because not only is it my single favourite engine design of all time, but much like the Helmet TX, it was the vehicle that proved beyond any question, beyond any doubt, that not only could a turbine engine be fitted into a vehicle and it could actually work, but much more than that, it could be a vehicle that customers could buy own, and legally, legitimately run on the street, while simultaneously being, to this day, still the fastest production motorcycle of all time. And that is, of course, the Marine Turbine Technologies Y2K Turbine Superbike. Only drivable, as far as I know, in Project Gotham 4 as standard. What a machine, and even though there have been a couple of more powerful versions, such as the 420RR and the Street Fighter, this original is the one for me. I love this bike. Again, the looks are not for everyone, a common theme in my favourite vehicles, but that engine, I was fortunate enough to see this bike or variations of it on more than one occasion at Goodwood, and it never fails to deliver. They only built 17 in its original form, it was Guinness verified at 229 miles an hour, and it makes the SSC Ultimate Aero's acceleration look slow. That can do 0-200, in what, 14 and a half, 15 seconds, as I said, this bike takes 15 seconds not to do 200, but to do 227 miles an hour, from zero to 227 in 15 seconds. That is insane, especially with a two-speed automatic gearbox running on regular pump diesel. What a bike. It sounds incredible. It idles at 20,000 RPM, cruises at 40,000, peak power at 52,000, and red lines are over 60,000 RPM, 420 pound-feet of torque, 320 horsepower, and about 290 horsepower at the rear wheel. It's an incredible machine, and of course, it is more than worthy to retain the top spot on my top 100, and categorise it as my single favourite vehicle of all time. Now, in the dream car category, or dream vehicle category, I'll be honest with you, I would choose a Cadillac 16 over this. And I know that sounds incredible and crazy compared to what I would usually say, perhaps, but the Cadillac really has shot up for me. And the more I think about it, the more I realise just how much I love that car. Overall, though, the FF is my dream car, the Cadillac is my theoretical dream car, and the Y2K is my favourite vehicle overall. So, of course, slap your top 10 down below. Tell me what you think of mine. Certainly a very strange mix, and I don't know of many lists where a Cadillac 16, a Y2K, and a Touareg would end up on the same list. But... 
that's the nature of my favourites. But overall, that's it for this instalment. Thank you for following this series if you've watched all five, and until next time, I'll see you then. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.